Hi everyone, Dr. Kennedy here, and today we're going to do some probability examples, including binomial and geometric probability. So let's have some fun. You do the math. For part A of this problem, I have to calculate the probability of each donation amount. So for $2, if I spun a zero, my donation would be $2. There are six wedges out of 10 total wedges that are $0. For my donation to be a dollar, I would have to land on $1, of which there are three out of 10. And to lose $8, I would have to spin on the one $10 wedge out of 10. So there's the probabilities for each of part A. Part B is asking for the expected value. So here's some notes on expected value. Expected value is the mean of a discrete distribution. To calculate it, you multiply each x times its corresponding p of x. So I'm going to do $2 times 0.6, or 6 out of 10, plus $1 times 0.3, plus negative 8 times 0.1 to get an expected value of 70 cents. So in the long run, if you did this many, many times, your average expected donation would be about 70 cents. Okay, part C. The charity would like to receive a net contribution of $500 from this game. What's the fewest number of times the game must be played for the expected value of the net contribution to be at least $500? So I want to know how many people need to play this game. So we want the expected value to be at least, which means greater than or equal to $500. So I'm going to set up an inequality here. So $0.70 cents times how many plays will be greater than or equal to 500. Here's an inequality. I'm going to divide both sides by 0.70, go to a calculator, and I get n is greater than or equal to 714.29. So the minimum number of plays is 715. You have to round up to the next number because 714 is not enough. So don't round to the nearest number, round to the next number. So 715 is the minimum sample size. Now we'll take a look at part D. In part D, the game will be played a thousand times. We want the probability of the net contribution of at least 500 in 1,000 plays. The mean and standard deviation of the net contribution are $792.79 respectively. Use a normal distribution. As soon as you see that phrase, you're going to draw the bell curve, the normal distribution. We were given the mean and the standard deviation, and I'm going to use the calculator to calculate the probability of at least 500 out of 1,000 plays. So $500 is less than $700, so not drawn to scale, but this is going to be to the left, and I'm going to shade to the right because I want at least $500. So I need to find this area here. And to find area under the normal distribution in the calculator, we're going to use normal CDF. C stands for cumulative distribution function. And the four things you need to type into your calculator are the left bound, the right bound, the mean, and the standard deviation. So I'm going to put in 500 as my left bound, infinity as my right bound, 700 is the mean, and 92.79 is the standard deviation. Let's go to the calculator and enter that information there. We go to second VARS, normal CDF, the second option, and enter the information they ask us for. So the E that I'm using for 1E99 to represent infinity is second comma. That means 1 times 10 to the 99, so some huge number that for our purposes are, is accurate enough and we get 0.9844. So if 1,000 people play, they're 98.44% sure that they're going to get at least $500. Okay, this is another expected value problem, and there's a lot of guess and check involved with this problem. It wants us to find the minimum number of choices that the student needs to eliminate before it is advantageous to guess among the rest of the choices. So I'm going to start by defining a random variable, x, as the score on a randomly chosen answer. So they describe in the question that if you get it correct, your score is 7. If you leave it unanswered, you get a score of 2. And if you get the question incorrect, your score is 0. So I'm going to set up a probability distribution table here with the three possible outcomes. So the values of x that are possible are 7, 2, and 0. What are the probability of each of those? Well, there's five choices, so there's a 1 in 5 chance you're going to get 7 points. Uh, the 2-pointer is if you leave it blank, so there's actually no chance of that if you're randomly guessing. But there's a 4 out of 5 chance you're going to get a 0, meaning you get the question incorrect. 
So the expected value, remember, is the value times the probability and then the sum of each of those. So it's going to be 7 times 1 fifth plus 0 times 4 fifths, which is 7 fifths. And that's 1.4. So we can expect about 1.4 points on average in the long run, which is less than 2. So it's actually better to leave it blank uh, rather than randomly guessing. So let's imagine that we're, we eliminated one of the choices. Now we have a 1 in 4 chance of guessing it right and a three, of, 3 out of 4 chance of guessing it wrong. So the new expected value with 4 choices is 7 times 1 fourth plus 0 times 3 fourths, which gives us 7 fourths. And that's 1.75 as a decimal, which is still less than 2. So it's not advantageous for us to guess. Now what if we eliminated 2 choices? Now there's a 1 in 3 chance of guessing correctly and getting 7 points, and a 2 out of 3 chance of getting 0 points and guessing incorrectly. The expected value is 7 times 1 third plus 0 times 2 thirds, which is 7 thirds as a fraction, or 2.3 repeating as a decimal, which is greater than 2. So in this case, it's advantageous for us to guess, because in the long run we'll expect an average of 2.33 points. So the answer is C. Okay, now let's take a look at some questions that are either binomial or geometric probability questions. This is a free response with three parts. So they give us a probability of 10% that coach class tickets will be upgraded to first class on any flight, and the outcomes are independent. That's one of the criteria for binomial and geometric probability questions. What is the probability that Sam's first upgrade will occur after the third flight? So now that is geometric probability because the question is asking us for the success on a certain number trial, and they don't give us a total number of trials. So we want the probability that the first success is after the third flight. So greater than 3 or greater than or equal to 4. You could think of it that way. So for greater than or greater than or equal to, we need to do 1 minus Geomet CDF. So we're going to do 1 minus the probability that x is less than or equal to 3. x here, by the way, is the event that SAM is upgraded. So 1 minus Geomet CDF, and you only have two inputs for Geomet CDF, and that is the probability of success and the number of trials that you want the first success to occur on. So just for clarity here, I'm going to define the random variable x. You should always do that on a free response question. So I'm going to go to my calculator and type in 1 minus Geomet CDF is found in the second VARS, the distribution menu. And it's way down, so you can either scroll down or you can scroll up to get down to the bottom. And I'm going to enter the values here, and we get a probability of 0.729. Also, when you write down calculator input notation, you should always label what the numbers represent. So 0.10 is the P, 3 is the X. Okay, part B is asking us the probability that Sam will be upgraded exactly two times in the next 20. This is binomial probability because they give us a fixed number of trials, a total number of trials. So we want the probability of exactly two in the next 20. So this is going to be binome PDF. P stands for probability, C stands for cumulative, and we have three pieces of information to enter. N, the total number of trials, P, the probability of success, and X, the specific endpoint. So let's enter that into the calculator. Again, we're going to go to second VARS and find binome PDF. Enter the information, and we get 0 0.2852, 0 0.285 to the nearest thousandth. Okay, let's take a look at part C. Sam will take 104 flights next year. Would you be surprised if Sam receives more than 20 upgrades during the first year? Justify your answer. So when they ask us a question about how surprised we would be or whether or not we would be surprised, we want to find the probability. And if the probability is less than 5%, that tends to be where we draw the line. If the probability comes out less than 5%, we'll say that we're surprised. It's a surprising result. This is also known as a significant result, a statistically significant result. So the probability that X is greater than 20 out of 104 total flights, this is again a binomial situation. So to do greater than, we need to do 1 minus the probability that X is less than or equal to 20, and that's 1 minus binome CDF. 104 is the total number of trials, 10% is still the probability of success, and we want 20 as the endpoint, and remember we're subtracting that away because we don't want to include it in our answer. Greater than 20 is the same as greater than or equal to 21. So you want to subtract off every case 20 or below. So I'm entering this into the calculator, and we get 0 0.0014. This is even less than 1%. So this is a surprising result. 
So because this is such a low probability, we would be surprised. And here's a problem involving normal probability. These are very common. So they tell us that the commuting time is normally distributed. As soon as I see that I draw, I draw a normal distribution. They give us a mean of 30 minutes and a standard deviation of 5 minutes. If the student leaves home at 825, what is the probability that they will arrive at the college campus later than 9 a.m.? So that's a commute time greater than 35 minutes. So 30 is right in the middle, since that's the mean. 35 is going to be to the right of the mean. So this is not drawn to scale, but 35 is greater than 30. And I'm going to shade to the right, because I want greater than. So the probability that x, and x here is the random variable of a student's travel time, the probability that x is greater than 35 minutes is normal CDF, and we have to enter four pieces of information. The left end point, the right end point, which here is infinity. And when I say end point, I'm talking about the shaded region. And then the mean and standard deviation. We go to the calculator, second vars, the distribution menu. And to type infinity, I'm using 1e99, and the e is second comma. And that basically is 1 times 10 to the 99th power, so it's a very large number. This will be accurate enough. And we get 0.158655. Choice A is the closest. Okay, here's a question. This is an interesting question that you could do directly, but if you apply the law of large numbers, it's actually a very easy question to answer. If at least 70% of the game in a series of n games is won, the player wins a prize. Here are the possible choices for n. Which value of n should the player choose in order to maximize the probability of winning a prize? Since the mean, the probability of winning, is 0.5, and we want at least 70, 70 or more, that's an extreme result. We should choose the smallest sample size. Think about flipping a coin 10 times. You're more likely to see extreme results under those circumstances than if you were to flip 100 times or 1,000 times. As you increase the number of trials, the empirical observed results will approach the theoretical results. So if you want a result that's far from that, like 70% or more extreme, you need to do a smaller number of trials. It's more likely to happen under those conditions. Thank you so much for watching my statistics videos. Please subscribe to my channel if you like my content and spread the word. And as always, may the math be with you.